Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm I'm Jonathan. I'm a, a white man in my early thirties with short brown hair and dark glasses, and I have a large microphone in front of me. Um, more on why we've asked today's speakers to describe their appearance a bit later. Um, I head up ITV's in-house audio description department, providing this key access service for ITV programmes at linear transmission and for on-demand platforms, including the ITV Hub and BritBox. Um, so first off, building on what Nigel said, I'm going to just talk a little bit about kind of how AD audio description or AD works at ITV. Um, and then talk a bit more about sort of ways that I think it can potentially help in a in an education setting. Um, so as Nigel was saying, audio description, a spoken narration that makes content accessible to blind and visually impaired audiences, um, describing on screen elements that are not obvious from a program soundtrack and uh, describing people's movements. Descriptive information is also given around people's appearances and what locations look like. And the AD also conveys important on-screen text, such as a program's title or information captions throughout a program. There's no uh, one size fits all for audio description. Um, it differs greatly depending on the content. So in something like Dinner Date, there are very few opportunities to describe due to the dense dialogue and narration. Uh, we would describe the, the what happened next at the end and, and probably not much else. But in a drama, there's a lot more opportunity to provide meaningful description. And often the AD really carries the story in a drama. Imagine the police officer tiptoeing through a dark warehouse trying to apprehend a criminal. Our job is to describe their movements, ensuring that we retain the tension and the mood, uh, which might mean leaving space for important sound effects and allowing the music to breathe. Essentially, an audio describer describes the uh, relevant visual information by translating it into words. Um, so over repeated viewings of a TV programme, an audio describer will write a script that conveys as much of that relevant visual information as possible, carefully timing this to fit into the gaps in the programme dialogue. Um, the finished project is then checked and compiled later on after being recorded to different formats, depending on whether it's for a linear broadcast or for an on-demand platform. Users can access audio description on regular linear TV as well as on on-demand platforms. Uh, here at ITV, we've been working on various initiatives to improve our offering to blind and, and visually impaired audiences. Last year, we began a, a permanent focus group of around 30 ITV viewers who make use of AD. This group meets every couple of months um, and the members feedback on a wide range of issues from editorial aspects about the, the actual content of our descriptions to more um, technical issues and usability issues of, of ITV platforms. This forum's also been a place where we, we've been able to carry out user research um, into specific sort of audience issues and, and, and new concepts. So one of these research projects has centered on how on-screen diversity is conveyed to our audience, specifically visual information around race and ethnicity. This is a is a complex issue that's, you know, a conversation that's been going on in, in audio description for, for a number of years. Um, the crux of it is that the audio describer chooses what is relevant for the AD audience and balances that with uh, what can be conveyed in the time available. So uh, the gaps between the, the program dialogue. Historically, the determination of relevance has been, you know, mostly in relation to the plot of a program. So describers would mention race when race was an overt part of a, of a program's content. Describers had concerns about saying the wrong thing and also about not being able to describe in an even way. So due to the time constraints that I mentioned, the result for the audience can be that an unspoken assumption is conveyed, which could be white unless stated otherwise, which is clearly not satisfactory, both in terms of how plot related information about diversity is conveyed and in terms of communicating uh, wider improvements in on-screen diversity uh, to an audience which depends on the AD to tell them about it. One thing this users group that we, we run has really driven home for me is that there is no perfect audio description that will serve all users equally. Just as with a non-blind audience, people's needs and expectations are driven by their circumstances 
and by their own experience of sight loss and the degree of vision that they have. This research on diversity is timely as other areas of the AD industry, such as theatre, have been re-evaluating how race and casting are conveyed to AD users. And here at ITV, we've moved away from an approach that determines relevance solely in relation to the plot to one that can encompass other important factors such as on-screen representation. So last year, we brought in a new editorial policy to encourage our describers to bring race and other visible diversity cues on a par with other physical characteristics and even going further and asking our describers to include this information as the default unless there's a, a reason not to, which might be that there isn't enough time to, to give any physical information about a character. We've had really positive feedback about this new approach from users and from kind of other stakeholder groups um, and other broadcasters as well. So hopefully it's something that users will start to see um, and hear, you know, spreading further afield. This is the only way that AD audiences can get a truer sense of when broadcasters are doing well with their diversity targets and when they're not. Um, we're also committed to keeping this, this approach quite fluid, aiming to increase our own cultural competency as describers and striving to be equitable in, in the way we, that we describe people. When programmes such as uh, Bridgerton seek to break the mould by having a cast that is diverse beyond what might have been historically accurate at the time, it's important that the AD reflects this. That's the only way that our audiences can be a part of the diversity conversation. So what relevance does this have in an education setting? For me, there are two main areas. Firstly, in how educators and speakers can help advance that sense of representation for blind and visually impaired audiences. And secondly, in making lesson and lecture content more inherently accessible and inclusive. Self-describing is becoming more and more common with the explosion in online meetings and events. Um, it can help blind and visually impaired people recall individuals and identify them later. And most importantly, it gives blind people access to the same visual information that non-blind people take in automatically. Having speakers self-describe at the start of a meeting or a lecture allows blind attendees to get a sense of the diversity and representation of the organisation. And it's also important in order to be inclusive. There's an excellent resource about self-description for inclusive meetings on the, the Vocalize website. It talks about why and when it's needed as well as how to do it. And hopefully Phil will be able to share that link after the after the session. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now just by talking a bit about how I think educators and other organisations can use some of these principles I've discussed today to make their content and materials more inclusive for blind and visually impaired audiences. As Nigel was saying, it's, it's perfectly possible to add audio description like we do for, for television to any sort of content, including educational materials. But the, the, the sort of general recommendation, I think, for improving the user experience across the board is actually to think about accessibility when the content's being created rather than tacking on audio description afterwards. TV is primarily a visual medium, so it makes sense that we do the AD separately and make it available to those who want it but the slide deck used in a presentation can easily back up the information in the speaker's text rather than being the sole place for any single piece of information. A video shouldn't have any important piece of information presented solely as a visual or as on-screen text. If that message is spoken as well, and if images or graphics are described, it makes the content accessible for blind users. It also improves the subtitles or the transcripts because it means they're a better reflection of the whole range of the content. And that in turn improves the web accessibility and the, the, the SEO of the content as well. Um, it also means people who might have an additional requirement about how they process and retain information, but not consider to seek out or request audio description, get a more inclusive experience too. And finally, Research in the, the museum space has shown that users of all abilities are more likely to retain information and details about visual artworks if they have those works described to them in words. I'm, uh, I'm on my last 30 seconds, Phil. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the kind of checklist, I guess, that, that I'm wanting to close with is firstly to describe important visuals. Doesn't need to be an essay, just try and avoid having a visual as the sole method of communicating an important point. 
Second, consider making audio description for important visual content such as pictures or video materials and ensure that important text in pictures or videos is made available separately or voiced in the video. And finally, when you're making subtitles available for video content, if the platform supports it, try and upload it as a separate file rather than as a burnt in part of the media, because doing this means that the text is also available as a transcript, which can help also help a wide range of users. For example, blind users who might prefer to consume the information more quickly via a screen reader application. So that's all I've got, um, but I'm looking forward to, to, to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Bang on time. Um, we've had a lot of chat in the um, a lot of chat in the chat. <laughs> funnily enough, um, Martin King has kindly put a link to a, a MOOC um, on audio description. Uh, so thank you, Martin. So please check that out, everyone, um, if you haven't seen the link already. Um, does anyone have a question for Jonathan? Um, if you do, please raise your hand now and we can give you permissions to unmute your mic. We have one hand up there. Cassia, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. That was really interesting. Um, I was particularly keen to, to know because you said about uh, it's always best to um, make something accessible from the start rather than trying to tag something on afterwards. So I was just wondering how much, if, if at all, you work with the, the producers of the shows themselves to kind of uh, get them to think more accessibly and, and, and think about um, how audio description might fit in or, or, you know, how captioning might fit in or sign language might fit in to to the to the show itself. Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, firstly, just to say that that kind of recommendation, um, I think um, eventually is something that that we'll we'll start to see more of. But it was more a kind of recommendation for um, how to make something accessible when you haven't got a team of subtitlers and audio describers at your um, beck and call, you know. And um, so for TV, it, it, subtitling and and audio description, I think both remain a kind of quite a post production, you know, post production processes. Um, but you know, from we have had experience of um, you know production companies getting in touch and um, you know us being able to support them in in kind of. I'm thinking of an example a, a couple of years ago where there was a game show. Um, which we didn't have the sort of capacity to take on as part of our um, audio description remit, but we were able to sort of advise the producers on ways that they could make the, you know, elements of the the narration of the programme a bit more inclusive by by kind of things that I was saying, like, you know, describing um, text that was um, conveying whether an answer was right or not. Um, so I think I think it's something that hopefully will continue to, to you know, um, a program being more inclusive from a from an you know we're always going to need subtitles to be to be available as an option for people um, and I don't think that's going to be something that production companies are going to start doing but um, you know the ability to sort of I guess just share these kind of pointers and um, you know have that contact with production is something that that's really important and you know hopefully we'll we'll see more more work in that area in the future. Thank you that's great. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I know Mike has his hand up as well, but I'm so sorry, Mike. We're going to have to move on to the next speaker to keep everyone to time. If you could stick it in the chat, that would be really helpful. Thank you.